issue. That issue um, may look trivial to some people, but it has done some um, important distinctions in Taiwan. It's about the myth about health risk assessment of EPA specifying an acceptable level of less than one in a million, or 10 to the minus six, based on the guidelines of health risk assessment set by EPA. Uh, that was uh, published about two years ago. It's, uh, uh, a document that um, uh, would be followed by uh, many industries and, uh, when they start to uh, plan on a new project. The background is many new development projects in Taiwan are struggling with meeting this guideline in a major petrochemical project, Huang uh, Shihua, was turned down based on these guidelines uh, last year, the year before last. And it has been called uh, so-called environmental crisis, not to fit the uh, theme of this uh, Conference. It requires successfully passing the health risk assessment uh, for any new in industry application. And it states that when cancer risk exceeded one in a million, or 10 to the minus six, an effective risk reduction plan by the applicant is to be submitted, subject to a review by an EPA team. In other words, in EPA view, this 10 to the minus six level of risk uh, or well, exceeding this rate may be uh, unacceptable, uh, unless you can uh, justify it. One in a million. Uh, you can see one in a million start from 10 to the minus one. That's the one uh, second, one third, one ten. And then 10 to the minus two is the one to 100, up to nine to 100. And then 10 to the minus 3, 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 5, 10 to the minus 6. So it's a, a, a tenfold difference uh, for each uh, number. There is a, uh, I set up this uh, table up now, comparison of acceptable risk level between residents in an environmental uh, situation versus uh, workers in an occupational uh, setting. Uh, residents set by EPA, it, these are outside the fence of our factory. And then workers set by labor department is those inside the fence. The subject in the uh, EPA is uh, the general public, including the old, the young, and the vulnerable. And inside the fence is healthy workers, you know, the, uh, the, the, the productive, you know, mostly uh, men and women. The exposure time is somewhat different. In the uh, environment, it's 24 hours, seven days, with, no, as long as uh, 70 years. In the workers, it's eight hours, uh, mostly eight hours, five days, up to 30, 40, 45 years. So there's some difference in exposure time. There's a difference in the subjects of uh, vulnerability, and the, but the exposure level are uh, quite different. All imagine that there is a, a, a lot more exposure inside the fence than outside the fence. The level set up by Taiwan in the acceptable risk uh, in the environment is 10 to the minus 6, and the workers uh, is like 10 to the minus 3. The, the 10 to the minus 3 against 10 to the minus 6 is a thousand fold different. A different thousand fold is this. Now, it, it, it was, it was puzzling to me, and it looks uh, too big to be um, uh, explained by the exposure time difference or exposure of the uh, vulnerable uh, population versus the public community, uh, particularly because of the level. Uh, uh, the, the resident in the environment, they do move in and out of the resident. They are mostly living inside the house rather than outside. So the exposure uh, are quite inconsistent no, to uh, workers who are exposed to it. Let me ask one simple question. We have 23 million people in Taiwan. If there is a risk, is one death per million, how many people would die in a year? I think it's very obvious. People would think about 23 deaths per year. Is this right? Technically speaking, it's not exactly right. Why? Because the way US EPA or FDA defined one in a million 
is one in a million is occurring over a 70 year lifetime in a large population. So 70 divided by 23 would be three. In other words, in reality, the answer should be one death in three years if it's a one per million. One death in three years. The risk derived from the lifetime risk in animal experiments. Uh, the, the reason for this lifetime risk is most of the uh, uh, data came from animal experiments. And for a mouse, a rat, that will live two to three years. And, and they uh, extrapolated that uh, lifetime risk of a rat, uh, it will become a lifetime risk of a uh, population of, of humans. That's one in a million. Is it that bad? And it's not acceptable. <coughs> of course, no. Oh, oh, well, there are more than 400 deaths a, a day occurring in Taiwan. But one death can be too many. Joseph Stalin said, no, one death is a tragedy. But a million death is just a statistic. And you don't have emotion attached to the death. So what's in a one in a million? It's not a line based on hard fact. One should be familiar with the assumptions or uncertainty behind this one in a million. And there are quite a few of them. One in a million came from animal studies. They are not from humans. Many assumptions and uncertainties are needed to extrapolate across species from animals with high dose to humans with low dose. There are a lot of assumptions, a lot of uncertainty. And then there is a safety factor apply, typically like a 100 you know, safety factor. And then most background risk that we face every day, crossing the street, exposure to uh, air pollution, and all of that, is order, order of magnitude larger than one in a million. For instance, mortality of smokers, for instance, is one out of two, or at most one out of three. It's 10 to the minus one. 10 to the minus 1. And smokers all accepted. They accepted that kind of a 1 minus, uh, 10 to the minus 1 risk. In definition, 1 in a million is called de minimis risk. The de minimis risk, now as I mentioned, 1 in a million occurring over a 70 year lifetime, and used by US EPA and FDA. It's not a line for acceptable risk. It's really almost like a negligible risk. Now, one in a million is a risk for the society to assess. And it's not for individual. Or to an individual, the risk is yes or no. It, it, the probability doesn't mean much. If I get it, if I don't. There's a significant risk. There's a, a Supreme Court decision in the U.S. in 1980, OCAW is a labor union of oil, uh, OSHA, uh, oil company workers. They're against the OSHA on how the benzene exposure standard should be set. And U.S. Supreme Court ruled that one per thousand is a significant risk. A significant risk is, is not necessarily acceptable or not acceptable. So the best effort should be made to reduce it. So significant risk in the Supreme Court decision is one per thousand, 10 to the minus three. And, and benzene to be set so that a worker in his working life, 30 to 40 years, is less than 10 to the minus three. Following that decision, OSHA in the Labor Department has modified or, or, or set the risk level of all occupational exposure using this rule. Excess cancer for 1,000 workers, 10 to the minus 3 risk. And you can see ethylene oxide, asbestos, benzene, formaldehyde, you know, cadmium, one tributyldiene, almost one by one in the Federal Register. You can see they were based on this uh, assumption set by Supreme Court, Supreme Court that one per thousand is a significant risk that should be you know, used as a standard. So perceived risk, perception is a reality. It's a vitally important, but it may not be reasonable, you know, the perception. As we all know, voluntary risk is more acceptable than involuntary, familiar than unfamiliar risk. Old risk is acceptable than new, immediate and future, uh, controllable than un 
able to control and seriousness consequences like you know, nuclear power plant that's not acceptable, even the risk of the probability can be low, and the fairness of the risk level. I just use one example, oral cancer in Taiwan. And you see this uh, line, uh, uh, it's a male oral cancer rate in Taiwan in the, in the period of about 25 years. And this is age specific, and look at the different age group, uh, the, no, age of 50, age of 55. They have jumped from 1986 to uh, no, 2009 in, in a period of about uh, 23 or 25 years. Uh, Six to seven fold increase. Six to seven fold increase. Now, what happened? Of course, most of the people in Taiwan know it. this is a male phenomenon. No. Yeah. Uh, female, no. Taiwanese women are much smarter. They don't uh, smoke, they don't uh, chew. And this is one of the uh, <laughs> reasons that the men would uh, cater to this chewing beetle quit. And these were sold by the uh, attractive uh, girls. Uh, even uh, almost in every street corner in Taiwan. And the government, including health, gar uh, health departments, or, uh, they all allow this to continue. A, a phenomenon, a, a very tragic phenomenon that's going on. So, and chewers in Taiwan, we have about a million and a half or two million chewers. It's not a small number. If it's a small number, now we can disregard it. About Close to 2 million. And number of deaths attributable to chewing is about 18,000 a year. Every year, there's 18,000 die from this chewing. So the risk of death is 10,000 in 1 million. No, not 1 in 1 million. It's 10,000 in 1 million. Which is by 1 thing to E1. The risk of oral cancer is 3,000 in a million. 3,000. So risk is. It's acceptable, 10,000 in one minute. Of course it's not acceptable. However, the reality is we are all accepting it and also turn our head the other way, not trying to you know, see how we can reduce this risk. Is human judgment based on reasonable thinking? Why people are continue to chew a bit of it? Another thing, motorcycles in Taiwan. This is a, a lot more common everyday activity. Number of motorcycles in Taiwan, if you look into the formal statistics, about 15 million. 15 million in Taiwan. It's one of the highest density in the world of the motorcycle. The implication is, number one, the traffic confusion. You all see that. Number two is poor national image for tourism. <coughs> People uh, come to Taiwan with great excitement and great, great expectations. And then after they saw this motorcycle, they were, uh, many of them were turned off and feel um, disappointed. Number three, the air pollution with high PM 2.5 associated. And there are about 2,000 lung cancer deaths in, in Taiwan with non-smoking. What happened with these uh, non-smoking lung cancer deaths? Mostly women. The PM 2.5 uh, is high. And then last but not the least is most important, the accidents and death caused by motorcycle. They hurt the riders as well as hurt, hurt others. Out of 1,500, uh, I mean, uh, one, uh, 15 million, uh, I would say 4 million riders every day, and they contribute to about 2,000 deaths a year and 200,000 injuries. So out of 4 million, the risk of death is 500 per million, 500 per million. And look at how many people are riding motorcycles. We have about at least 4 million riders every day. And they are faced with a risk of 500 per million. Or the risk of injuries, 50,000 per million. So we have so many more important things to do. Now we're talking about the perception is reality. But it may not be correct. Your acceptable risk may be very high. Acceptable. Risk may be acceptable, but the risk is very really high. Or unacceptable risk it may not be that high. So perceive the risk from motorcycle. 500 per million and 50,000 per million in the injuries. And then perceive the risk from chewing beetle quick 
is 10,000 and 1 million, these risks have been widely accepted. So my conclusion is now, EPA guidelines requiring a successful passage of health <coughs> risk segment, specifying a level to be attained at less than 1 in a million, is really in comparison with other risks. It's not a reasonable one. And it's caused economic hardship nationwide. And such a requirement has also caused a panic situation and hampered the economic development. What was mislabeled as it's an environmental crisis. So I would call for a careful review of the current guideline for health risk assessment set by EPA to uh, review this so one per million. That would be like a cutoff for a, a new uh, industry, a new development that can be accepted by the uh, public in terms of health risk. That's all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Wen. Now I'm glad to introduce Dr.